So as I said, we're um, continuing our series on judges. We've moved on from Deborah and Barak of two weeks ago. About 40 years have gone by, and um, the Israelites have taken their eye off the Lord yet again, and things have gone wrong. And tonight we come on to uh, Gideon, Gideon's call and preparation. And our overall title is Unlikely Heroes. And really the thing splits into four sections, and we'll see how we get on. I might give up <laughs> before we get to four. Um, but we, we start off by saying, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And no, though we're not told exactly what they did, it's fairly clear that they disregarded God's word about intermarriage, and they were influenced heavily by the Canaanites who lived around them. And that they began to pick up some of the customs of the Canaanites, including their gods. And it wasn't so much that the Israelites gave up on God, they just added two more gods to their collection, to their portfolio. So they had God, and then they had Baal, and then they had Asherah for safekeeping. The god of rain and the god of fertility seemed to work for the Canaanites. And so they were influenced by the, the surrounding people. And of course, this is exactly what happens to us. We are so influenced by the world around us that we sometimes forget what God's message says because we are so pressured by everything in the paper, the television, everything, which is about the world. It tells you that, um, quite clearly in verses 4 to 6, it was a time of great oppression. The Midianites were determined to destroy the Israelites, which is what the Israelites should have done to the Midianites, if you remember your history, but they didn't. They didn't finish the Midianites off. They did defeat them in battle, but they didn't finish them off. And the Midianites have clearly repopulated and have now come back to haunt the Israelites. Um, and what happens is, it's only after they've gone through seven years of hardship that they turn back to God. They don't seem too bright, do they, really? It takes them seven years to work out that they need to call to God. And it really reminds us that our call to God shouldn't be a last resort. And it so often is in all of us. It's a last resort. And we trust everybody else more than we trust God. And in our last resort, we go to God. And really, we should go to God first. It's a lesson for me. It's a lesson for you. It's a lesson for all of us. Keep God at the center of your life all the time, not only when things get out of control. God warns us that the struggles, we will have struggles, He's not saying life will be easy, but he promises to give us the strength to cope with whatever is thrown against us. And when you think of those Russian people, if they call on him, he will give them the strength to cope. And if you imagine what that's actually like, only God can give you that strength. And what's interesting, when God hears their cries, this time he doesn't send a judge straight away to help them, does he? He sends a prophet to tell them off. And in particular, in verse 10, it says this, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. Now, how relevant is that today? How does that fit in with us? In many ways as a nation, we've refused to stay close to God and live according to his word. And our nation's sinfulness as a whole then translates into weakness. And this weakness invites enemies of righteousness to move in. And we see it in our lifetime, how this country is changing. And consequently, we've been invaded by the world, the worldliness of the world, not an army of Midianites, an army of consumerism and things such as that. We want to be like everybody else, and everybody wants to be like us, which is why a lot of these people are fleeing from horrendous situations to move into Europe. They see Europe as a, as a place of wonder, and we don't see it sometimes. And consequently, the church has become weak, in this country, and it's seen by many in this country as irrelevant, which is completely different to what it was, say, 50, 70 years ago. And yet in Psalm 33, it says this, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. And we've turned our back on God as a nation and allowed worldliness to be our new God. We have to face facts. We're living in a country that doesn't belong to God anymore or the people don't belong to God. And in God's eyes, this worldliness is equates to sinfulness. It's true on a national scale, and it's true on an individual scale. Sin, or following the world, which is so easy to do, isn't it? It's just so easy to slip into the way of the world. 
in God's eyes, equates to sinfulness. Sinfulness then robs us of our character. It leaves us unwilling and unable to fight. It's, if sin festers in our heart, we become listless, lifeless and lethargic in our Christian life. Now you're thinking, hang on a minute, I work really hard. Yes, we do. But we work, tend to work in a little environment really called Aldwick, Aldwick Baptist Church. Where is the thrusting out? Where are the big things, the big moves? And really, God can't use us and can't use this country while we're away from him. And sin causes us to hide in fear. We're frightened to go out. Just as Gideon is going to be shown to be frightened in a minute, we're frightened to go where the enemy goes. We want to stay in our cozy, cozy little world. Um, so sin is a problem for everybody. But we have one thing that Gideon didn't have. We know that Jesus came to take away our sin. And when we go around the communion table, we'll be looking at that. We know that sin doesn't have to dominate our lives and control us. We can hand it all to Jesus. And he took our sin at the cross. And we need to remember that continually. Sin has been defeated. It's not completely gone away, but it's been defeated. And we know that we're on the winning side. So let's have a look at Gideon. In verse 11, we first meet him. It's clear that uh, Gideon... And his family had been able to hide away a small amount of wheat. And he was threshing it in the wine press so that nobody could see him, because he knew if he, the Midianites saw him, they'd come and take it. Even a small bit, they'd come and take it. It was clearly a time of great persecution and a period of great powerlessness. The Israelites had no power. They were completely dominated by the Midianites. And Gideon was one of those people. He was just as defeated and frightened as the rest of the nation. And it was a difficult time for God's people. And it's a difficult time for God's people now, everywhere, including this country. It's a difficult time for God's people. What are we going to do about it? The answer is we need to rely on God, of course. At this point, the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said something truly amazing. There's Gideon hiding in the wine press, okay, frightened of his shadow. <laughs> and he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. <laughs> Now, I think you can imagine Gideon's um, total disbelief in hearing these words. Okay? Just looking from the outside, it doesn't look like Gideon will amount to much in the Lord's work. He's fearful, he's timid, he's filled with self-doubt, he has more questions than answers. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> I think we have more questions than answers. However, the Lord is willing to take Gideon just as he is and shape him into something that he wants him to be. And that's exactly the same as us. God will take you as you are and shape you into what he wants you to be if you let him. Now, it's clear that Gideon, to start with, thinks that the angel is talking about the Israelites, not just Gideon. And, and it's clear also from verse 13 that Gideon has been taught about God and the miraculous deeds for Israel that God had done in the past. He knows all about that. But in this, way, in this sort of way, he repeats what the prophet had just told the Israelites. But he does it in a different sort of way. He says... The prophet spoke and rebuked you, but I'm going to put it the other way around. He says this. He says, um, Gideon, Gideon accuses God of forsaking his people. That he, Yes, God done it in the past, but where is he now? Why are we having such hardship? Are you sure you're from the Lord? This is Gideon's response. Are you absolutely sure? Because actually, my eyes tell me differently. We're struggling. We're suffering. Where are you? How can you be from the Lord? But God will have none of this, as you see in verse 14. It says, The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Okay, suddenly Gideon realized the significance of you. Not you, the Israelites. You, Gideon. Hang on a minute. <laughs> Gideon objects, I'm not the man for this job. You must have somebody else in mind. It can't be me. How can I save Israel? I'm a nobody from an insignificant family. But God will not listen to his objections. He tells Gideon that he'll be able to destroy the Midianites altogether in one go. Amazing words. In other words, the Lord is going to do something so powerful and so wonderful and so amazing that the whole of history is about to be changed. And all Gideon has to do is go along with God's plan. But <laughs> Gideon is not quite ready to follow the Lord yet, is he? He wants some proof that this is really God talking to him. 
And so he asks for a sign. And thankfully, we serve a patient God, an understanding God who understands Gideon's weakness and understands his hesitancy. And God graciously gives God, Gideon the sign that he asks for. So verse 18 to 19 tells us that Gideon wants to make an offering to the Lord and the Lord promises to wait while Gideon go and gets his stuff. So Gideon prepares a goat, some bread, a pot of broth. And remember, this is a man who has almost nothing. So this must be all of what they have, everything. It's amazing to see the transformation in Gideon already starting to take place. When the angel of the Lord found him, he was hiding in the wine press, frightened, he had a little bit of grain. Now he's willing to give away all, his stew, all the food they have in a huge meal as a sacrificial gesture. Gideon has reached a place where he's willing to give up the things he values most, the only food they've probably got left. And when he does so, the Lord accepts his offering. He touched it with his staff, it's consumed in a fire, and Gideon can see the connections to how this has happened in the past. And in receiving the sacrifice he did, the Lord is teaching Gideon that everything is going to be okay. Everything will go well, so long as you follow me. God had come to Gideon, he'd called him, he'd commissioned him, and now he accepted his offering to confirm this is, this is going to be what's going to happen. I'm going to use you mightily. Gideon, stop panicking. I'm going to be with you. And if you want to be used mightily by the Lord, follow Gideon's advice. Present yourself to the Lord and he will use you. His, his will is we make an offering like Gideon. It doesn't mean you go and find a goat and make some bread. And, and some broth, it doesn't mean that. God's interested in all of you. He wants you to give everything you have to him, all your life, all your time, everything. God wants to be first in your life. And the world says differently, but God says, I am first. Gideon now recognizes who he's dealing with. He recognizes, gosh, this is the Lord. This is a bit scary because the Israelites know that they die if they see the Lord. That's their belief which is why God then reassures him, no, you're not going to die. And why Gideon builds this altar called the Lord is peace. God found peace in submitting to God's will. Gideon found peace, all these G's, Gideon found peace in submitting to God's will. And when he submitted to God's will, in humble worship, God is with him. So is it relevant today? Of course it is. Do you realize the Lord knows you better than you know yourself? Do you know that God sees not just who you are, he sees what you can be? And if you're like me, and I'm sure most of you are, you look at your life and you see the mistakes you've made, the failures, the problems you've not dealt with, you see a person who consistently doesn't live up to the standards God demands of us. You see a person who loses far more than he wins. You see a person like Gideon who appears to be coming up short of what God wants. But what does God see? God sees into our heart. He sees our potential. He knows what we'll be, what we will be when he's through with us. The best thing you can ever do is take our lives with all its problems. Don't try and solve the problems yourself. Take your life with all its warts and crooks and crannies and everything and give it to God and say, here I am, totally available for you. And he's able to take us as we are and transform us into something powerful and amazing by his power. And if you don't understand that, think what he did with Saul of Tarsus. Think what he did with Simon Peter. And then imagine what he could do with you and me and all of us. In the third section, we move on to Gideon growing in, in strength, growing in confidence. We've had this private meeting between God and Gideon. We now have a public demonstration of Gideon's faith. Well, we nearly do, because although Gideon is told to tear down these idols and burn the Asherah pole, he does it at night. He does it when nobody's looking. So yes, he obeyed God, but he also covered his tracks by doing it in the dark. Gideon knew his father, his brothers, his family, the rest of the village would be furious with him for tearing down the altar to Baal. He knew they'd probably want to kill him. But Gideon had some faith, although still small at this time, but he allowed fear to control his actions. Well, as Gideon anticipated, his actions did cause quite a commotion in the community. 
God was pleased with what Gideon did, but he was the only one who was pleased with what Gideon did. And after learning what Gideon had done, the man of the village went to Gideon's father and demanded that Gideon should be put to death for daring to defy Baal. And yet many of these people who did this were actually Israelites. This shows how far God's chosen people had fallen. In Deuteronomy, it tells them to stone people who, who worship idols. And now we've got a complete reversal that the people of Israel want to stone somebody for worshipping God. And we then see uh, Gideon's father stand up, who had been a follower of Baal. It's his, the altar appears to be on his land. And he stands up for his son. And he says, he says if Baal really is a god, Surely he can look after himself. You don't have to do it. And if you follow Baal, he's not a god. You're the ones who deserve to be stoned. My son is doing what the true God of Israel says to do. It's quite a turnaround for his father, isn't it? You see, so the action of Gideon, one person, makes the, another person react. And then the, as the story goes on, more people react, and gradually an army is formed to take on the Midianites. So one person started this. Well, God started it with one person. And that is the story of revival nearly every time. It's one or two people who start to come to God, get clear instructions from God, pray to God, and they gradually influence more and more people. And if ever a country needs that to happen, it's us now. And it can start with just one or two people. Are we those people? That's my question to us all. Okay, now how is that relevant today? Well, think about Gideon for a second. You're going to be deceiving yourself if you think everybody's going to be pleased about you being a Christian. There'll be people who just don't get you, and we have all know this from our own families, particularly families. Members of your family feel left out. It's a tough message, isn't it, putting Jesus first. It's a very tough message. Unspiritual people will feel threatened. Lost people will think you're promoting your own agenda. It's very current in government thinking, isn't it? You can't have the Christians saying this because it'll offend these people and those people. And we can't have them saying this because it'll offend... This is the world. It's not Jesus' world. It's not God's world. This is a government of compromise, a world of compromise, where you can do what you like so long as you don't offend anybody. In fact, you can do what you like, but you mustn't offend anyone. And this is not the way God planned it. God's intention is to transform us into the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. And why does he want to do that? So we can do the good works which he has prepared in advance for us to do. There's good works waiting for us to do, prepared by God himself. But we need to look for them. And the final section, so we're not doing too badly, this is the inner doubt of Gideon, and this is the inner doubt of every one of us. Gideon stood up to Baal, helped by his father. It was a step of faith, and although he did it at night to avoid being at first court, he did know they'd all know it was him. But following this public action, Gideon managed to raise an army. He becomes the inspirational leader, which you'll hear more about next week. Um, so the people see Gideon as this strong person now leading them against the horrible Midianites. But in verse 36 to 40, when Gideon's on his own, things don't look the same. And when I was looking at this, I did think about all the leaders in the world who have to stand up and make grave proclamations about all sorts of things. They sound so confident when they make these proclamations, like Tony Blair did. He sounded so confident but did he, in the heart of hearts, feel that confident? Or is it just your job to be that confident? And this is what made me think about it's so difficult being a leader of any sort. Of any sort. So Gideon is worried. And he, he goes to God again and he's still afraid. And what he's afraid of is not that God can't conquer the Midianites. He's not worried about that. He knows God can do that. What he can't see is why God wants to use him. He's a nobody. He still thinks he's a nobody. Why, oh, why do you want to use me, Lord? And so Gideon, Gideon says to God, he wants a sign. 
And we have this this sort of strangely amusing thing with the fleece twice. And God, Gideon wants God to confirm, not in words, but with a sign, that it is him, Gideon, who has to do this. And it's bad news, really, that Gideon doesn't take God's word alone. He wants proof. And how many times do you hear that from people? Just show me a sign. I know someone in this church, not who's here anymore, you say, if the traffic lights change to green when I'm driving towards them, I know God's on my side. How ridiculous is that? And that was a... Well, I won't go any further, okay? Okay? Okay. Um, Okay, but the good news is that Gideon is not proud or arrogant or full of his own self-confidence and his own ability. He's humble and he's actually scared to death and he's clinging desperately to God. And that is far better place to be than being sure of yourself. And sometimes we have to think of that. We can be desperately worried but cling on to God and he will give you the strength to go on. Just count on him. It's his strength, not yours that will get you through. One might be forgiven for thinking that God might just wash his hands of Gideon at this point, but instead of rebuking Gideon for his fear, he recognizes it for what it is, and he strengthens Gideon's fear by two miracles. Our world says the ones most likely to succeed are the ones who have great intellect, healthy, good self-esteem, tall, handsome, a bit like, you know, Robert Bell, yeah? <laughs> Good looking and aggressive. That's who he, the world thinks will, will, will be the, the successful ones. But in God's world, it's the weak who he uses to achieve his purposes. The entire book of Judges tells us about God choosing unlikely, reluctant people to achieve his purposes. The constant message is a little faith in a great God is far better than a great faith in oneself. And yet we're so often like Gideon, aren't we? We're just frightened to take a step of faith and obediently serve the Lord. We can't believe that God needs us individually. Collectively we might think we can see it, but individually God wants you. And yet throughout history God has used weak people to strengthen, to become great leaders. And it's sometimes your weakness rather than your strength, that encourages others. We know that God uses uses our weaknesses to bring about his purposes. And we should be encouraged by the weakness and frailty of Gideon because we are weak and frail too. We know we are. Others may be encouraged by us admitting our weakness and our total reliance on God. It's so the other way to the world, isn't it? The world relies on strength, individual strength or corporate strength or nation strength. We rely on God's strength. And I know whose side I want to be on. Um, We're unlikely to be asked to lead an army into battle. Very unlikely. But God does have something for each of us to do. And it doesn't matter how old you are. And it doesn't matter how busy you are, because it might not be about you being busy. It might be something else. And have you ever stopped to think what the world would be like if if every believer simply did what God asked them to do? There would be more power and glory in the church. More people would be saved. There would be more miraculous manifestations of God's presence in the church than it is today. Far more could be accomplished than you can possibly imagine if people just took God at his word and stepped out in faith. Stuart had a a picture at our deacons meeting on Monday and he said he saw this uh, well and God says, jump in. And he said he doesn't really know what it means. Maybe this is the same thing. Sometimes we have to jump in and trust God and we might not know what we're doing, but we jump in and trust God. So... What's today's message for you? Where does it leave you? Are you faithfully doing what God's called you to do? Or do you hold back because a little bit of your faith says it can't be me? Are you paralyzed by fear of failure? That's probably the most debilitating thing there is. People are worried about failing. God says don't worry about failing. Are you guilty of looking for signs 
rather than simply taking God at his word. Do you think God can't possibly mean to use you? And yet, yet God made each one of us unique. We are totally different to anybody else. And each of us has a specific ministry that is designed by God for us. We have our own individual ministry. And you may not have found it. I may not have found it. But it's there. God has his own individual ministry that only you can do. God wants you to serve him by doing what he wants you to do. God has not changed since those days. He's still a jealous God. And if he's chosen you in Jesus, saved by grace, and entered into a saving relationship with you, he expects you to live for him alone. He doesn't expect you to live for yourself anymore. He does not expect you to live for your things. He expects you to walk with him, love him, and live according to his will. When you do this, he will bless you greatly. Look at your life right now. I will look at my life right now. I've been looking at it all the week when I read this. Who is first in your life? If it's anyone other than God, you're looking in the wrong direction. Follow his will and he will be with you as he was with Gideon. Listen to his words. Am I not sending you? And that's you personally. That's God saying, am I not sending you? And you need to get to God in prayer, we all do, and study his word and work out what God is saying to us. What is it that God wants you to do that nobody else can do? We just thank you, God, for that wonderful message of Gideon. It sounds like it's nothing to do with us, does it? And yet it's so relevant when you look at it. Gideon's life and our lives are parallel. Gideon's world is very much like our world. The Christians what was the Israelites then, are on the back foot in the world. And God says, listen to me, do my will, and all will be well. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the, the life and times of Gideon and the rest of the judges and the fact that you took so many unlikely people and used them mightily for your service. Father, we ask you to take us with all our weaknesses and faults and show us what we need to do to be used by you. And Father, I just thank you that there's no one here who is outside your will, and everyone here has a part to play in your kingdom. So we just thank you in Jesus' name.